I'm far enough along at that point in time to be getting excited about the role of nutrition in cancer. But to see these kind of results, generalized as they may be, nonetheless pointing to something really significant. So let's go back a few more years. Uh, that's me there in, um, five or six years ago, I think it now. <coughs> Combining, I was raised on a dairy farm, as many of you may know, and it's me there on the front. Uh, sort of combining so we could get some money to go to school. We were raised on a, on a dairy farm. That's my brother's and my father's mother. But so on the farm, to, to the extent that I thought about this, and I have to be honest, I didn't think about it, <laughs> but it's just being, you know, sort of unconsciously aware that the milk that we were producing on the farm was valued in large measure because it had protein in it, high quality protein. It was also valued because of the calcium content too. I went away then to, to Cornell University to graduate school. And there, uh, I did my doctor's dissertation shown on the right. I won't go into the details there, but just generally speaking, it was designed to show, or dry, dry, it was designed especially, especially by my professors and others uh, to show the importance of protein. It was designed to try to figure out ways to grow animal protein more efficiently. So there you have it. I mean, it's just, that's the where it was. Then it was another 10-year period when I was working in the Philippines and the State Department was at Virginia Tech, where, in fact, there, my responsibility was to be coordinator of a national program of developing sort of wild childhood feeding centers, again, focused on protein. And the big deal about that at that time with these poor children who were malnourished and many of them almost starving, the big thing that we were intending to do, my senior colleague and I, was to make sure to close the protein gap, was it said in those days. Such was the, the emphasis given to protein, you know, across the land, publicly, professionally, politically, whatever. It, it was, everybody was obviously knowing that we have to get as much protein as we can, okay? That's what our deal was, is to, Oh, good, thank you. Can you hear me better? Yeah, okay. So, so, we, so I ended up in the Philippines. There, attempted to identify ways for these children to get more protein. That's why they're starving. That's why they're malnourished. There was so much emphasis given to that. So in, in reality, those three events, personal, up on the left, my graduate research, uh, directed to pr proving the production of protein, down in the Philippines. So it was all about protein. The more, the better. And I think many of you can identify with that. How many of you have sort of gotten into this business and your friends ask you, where, where do you get your protein from? You know, this idea still hangs around. So I want to develop, work on that theme a bit. So now, I'm in the Philippines. Um, I was aware, we're supposed to be getting more protein. I can't get into all the details on that particular point of view. But about that time, this study came out in India, showing that in experimental animals, in this case rats, that when these rats are exposed to a carcinogen that gives rise to liver cancer, okay, it starts out, you know, they're exposed to a carcinogen that gives rise to liver cancer. If they are fed a couple of levels of protein, high and low, that their thesis was, or hypothesis, was that the animals given the higher levels of protein would get less cancer. Such was the importance of protein. It does, you know, does everything. If we could just get more protein consumed, we could have less cancer. That was our idea. And as you can see here, the opposite appeared. The opposite appeared. They, they couldn't even go along with their own results. Quite frankly, they went back and redid the study in a very different way, and attempted to show it was the reverse. Um, I had a chance to go to India about 25 years after that, to talk about the fact that I didn't see it that way, that the animals given the highest protein levels got 100%, small study, 100% got the liver tumors, and the ones that fed 5%, none did. That was striking. Increasing protein, increasing cancer. How do you like that? So, I mean, there's only wearing just two hats, and essentially I'm interested in the science, I wanna, I wanna deal with the facts, but on the other hand, we're all worshiping protein, if you will, and somebody, somehow like this, this comes along and sort of shakes the, shakes the bushes a bit. 
So I came home, got a grant, it lasted for the next 27 years, and I really wanted to know, you know, is that really true? And if it is true, how, how does it work? What's the, what we call mechanisms? So here's a little chart showing uh, the first 12 weeks as the cancers are growing. I mean, all cancers start with a mutation, with a mutated gene. So they, they, they're supposed to occur in a gene that muta causes a mutation, okay? Then if that 20% or 5%, just like the Indian workers did, you can see the difference, it's huge, it's huge. Once for 20%, they're all getting cancer, it's going fast. This is just for during the first three months, which is you know, quite a long time for a, a rat. But here, here's, here's, I'm gonna show you this because something came up. This wasn't exactly done in this order, but here's what happened. I was curious about this idea that cancer is caused by genes, namely mutations. And mutations, for those of you who are not familiar with this, our genes are mutated by chemical carcinogens, they're changed, so that now the new gene, if it's not repaired, then becomes the basis for cancers to grow. I wanted to know in this particular case uh, whether, let's say, after two and a half months, they, they got the exposure to the carcinogen. At that time, you, think, you would think that all the mutations have all reversed, right? Or they're gone, or the carcinogen's not there. We fed them 20% protein, and lo and behold, what it showed was we saw a tumor response after one would have thought those genes are gone. No, they were still there, kind of hanging around. That led to a major consideration that as over the years it turns out that cancer, in this case here, is suggested cancer doesn't form as a result of the gene or the mutation. It functions primarily, as in this case at least, as a function of nutrition. Very different. So here's another way to look at the same thing. I ended up with, with a number of ideas that now since have become very provocative, even more provocative, in the sense that it t tends to challenge uh, the way we think or the way we do things. So here's my first challenge. Cancer begins with a mutated gene that may lie dormant until developed by, by nutrition, not by genes. Just think about that. We all have some genes that could give rise to cancer. We have the seeds, if you will. And when the reason, for the most part, uh, not to oversimplify, the reason we tend to get cancer is because we're feeding the wrong nutrition to those genes. So they come up and they form cancer. Here's another way to look at this. Same basis I showed before. I wanted to know in this particular case, what happens if we change the diet? from 20 to 5% or 5% to 20%, if you will. Here's the results we got. First three weeks, these early cancers are growing in response to 20%, turned off for the next three weeks, turned back on, turned off. To me, that was really a spectacular sort of thing. The idea that we could take nutrition right with the normal levels of consumption, more or less, and adjust it. <clears throat> adjust the amount being consumed, and actually change the course of the development of the disease. That was very exciting. <coughs> so in a sense, we were turning on and turning off cancer experimentally. 